Good morning, Project Church, and welcome. We're glad that you made it here bright and early. Yep. Early bird gets the worm. Sure does. We're happy to see you looking beautiful as always. <laughs> I'm Branson. I'm Heidi. We have some announcements for you guys leading into yeah. service. Um, first of all, we are coming off of fashion, which was such an incredible weekend. So we all amazing. had a great time. Super high we're coming off of. Oh, yeah. But the fun doesn't stop because next weekend on Sunday, the 31st, we have so many fun things planned. We are doing baby dedications. Yes. So if you have an infant or a child that you have not dedicated yet to the Lord, now is the time. Sign up on your church center Bring app. Them. We're also going to have a big old carnival outside. We're calling it Fall Day Fun. It's going to be all things fall, pumpkins, petting zoo, porch things. Yeah. Another party on the I porch. Party yeah. on the porch. Yeah. Right. It's going to be so fun. So don't miss out on that. Um, you can also sign up to help and volunteer there that day, which is going to yeah. be a blast on the church center app. So definitely do that. So speaking of signing up and helping out, um, Hope Week is coming up. It's going to be November 3rd through the 6th, Yay. and we're so excited for it. Even starting this week, you'll be able to sign up. There's going to be some amazing projects for helping us get involved with our community. Yeah. We believe at this church that servanthood is our calling. Um, and so let's just be the hands and feet of Jesus. Look for those opportunities and those projects that you can sign up. Um, and we're just so excited as we yeah. prepare for that. Yeah, it's going to be incredible. So don't miss out on that. And now it is time for service. So yes. are we going to jump in?
Church family, we so wish that we could be with you this Sunday, but we're grateful for the online capabilities. And so we want to give you an opportunity in this moment to continue in your worship, even online, through giving. We say every week that generosity is our privilege, and you guys really have stepped up to that privilege and continue to worship and giving. So I want to just encourage you, continue to do so, continue to be obedient in that way, and God will make himself made known through the ministries here at Project Church. Again, you're not giving to Project Church, you're giving through Project Church so that he might be made known. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for worshiping in this way. And we just want to say you can either give um, through the Church Center app or you can text PROJECT to 97000. God bless you as you keep giving. Church, want to welcome you to once again Church Online. My goodness, it has been a long time since we did this Church Online only. But thank you for your flexibility. Uh, obviously, with this huge storm, as well as the Ironman race that was happening, where literally there are road road closures all around us right now. It was going to be very difficult for people to even get inside the building. Uh, let alone for us to get everyone in the building. So uh, thank you for your flexibility. Church online, but hey, how many of you know we are the church uh, wherever we are? We can be the church from home. We can be the church in our living rooms. And so thanks for jumping in with us online, either live or some of you that are watching this back right now. We know that our church is all around the nation, not just in Sacramento, but nation. And uh, so thank you, church, for being a part of what we're doing. I do want to just make a couple quick announcements for you, let you know about some things going on. Uh, first of all, uh, man, we are super excited to be launching a co-working space. We're calling it the CoLab. So upstairs, we have a large space that we used to lease out to another business. Uh, they recently left during COVID, they left that lease. And so we had the idea, why not turn it into a co-working space uh, for people in our church or outside of our church? We want to have a monthly membership, a place to come, work, uh, create, collaborate, connect, um, build community. And so if this is something you're interested in, you're going to see uh, right now the link pop up and you can jump online. You could schedule a tour. Uh, Branson, if you don't know Branson, a part of our church, he's going to be running that collab for us. Uh, he'll bring you in, schedule a tour with you. You can do that through the website uh, that's below me right now on the screen, and, uh, and then you can check it out. So it's a monthly membership and a great place for you to be able to work. Maybe you're sick of working inside your home. A lot of you still working from home. Uh, maybe you're a creative entrepreneur. You're looking for a space uh, to, to connect with other people, to build community, and to create something. Man, we would love for you to join us. So you can jump in and be a part of that. Uh, also, make sure next Sunday you come back. We will be in person October 31st, it is our holiday fun after each service, 9 and 11. If you didn't hear the message, we're going back to the two services, 9 and 11 a.m. in person, but we're going to be having an amazing day right after each service, petting zoo, pumpkins, party on the porch, all kinds of games for kids, games for kids. So come out, bring your families. It's going to be incredible after the 9 or the 11 a.m. service. But today, we are jumping back into Marked by Jesus. If you didn't know, we've been walking through the book of Mark verse by verse uh, for the last two and a half years. And so we're coming now to the end of this book. This is an incredible book. Uh, Mark is a fast-paced gospel. It is the shortest of the four gospels telling the account of Jesus' life. And I just want to tell you, uh, man, we have gleaned so much from this text, from this gospel, and today we're jumping back in. We are in the final week of Jesus' life. In fact, the text I'm about to read to you from Mark chapter 14 is on Wednesday. Jesus is crucified on Friday, so this is literally two days 
before Jesus' crucifixion. And so today we're jumping in. I want to read from Mark chapter 14. I'm going to read verse 1 through 9. And this is a story that's a, a flashback, actually. And so we know from looking at the other Gospels, from looking at John and Luke, uh, actually that this story where Martha breaks this oil, this anointing oil, and pours it on Jesus, on his head, on his feet. Uh, we know from John that she actually wipes his feet with, his, with her hair. We know that this was done um, a few months before. But it is a flashback as Mark is writing here and really juxtapositioning the attack of the religious leaders on Jesus with a story about how much people love Jesus. And so I want to read, starting in Mark chapter 14, I'm going to start in verse number 1. I'm going to be reading through verse number 9 today. You can follow along with me uh, either on your Bibles, your devices, or will be on the screen for you as well. Mark 14 verse 1, it says this. It was now two days before the Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, him being Jesus, by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So the religious leaders, they're threatened by Jesus. He threatens the status quo. He has turned uh, the religious system upside down. He has made some bold claims about being God, being the son of God. And so they're ready to do away with him. But in this moment, there's a feast happening. And so there are thousands more people in the city than normal. And they're afraid of the crowds because they know that they look up to Jesus. They admire Jesus. They celebrate Jesus. They've seen Jesus do miracles. And so they're, they're threatened. They're worried. So they say, well, wait till after the feast. This is this plot to kill Jesus, which is fulfilled just two days later. And in this moment, Mark actually, Mark goes back. He does a little flashback for us and goes back to verse, or as we go to verse three, he goes back and he tells this story, an amazing story about love. And so while these religious leaders hated Jesus, and there were those that hated Jesus that were threatened by Jesus, there were many that loved Jesus. So I want to read verse three. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask. We know from the other gospels that this woman was Mary, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing. Everybody say beautiful thing. Wherever you are, say it. Look at the person next to you if you're in your living room with your family. Tell them a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I want to share a message with you today entitled, When Love does beautiful things. When love does beautiful things. And this story is a story about love. It's a story about what we do when we love something or someone. And I was thinking about love. How many know that there's a certain look to love? I mean, you all know uh, if you've ever been in love, when someone is in love, they got a look to them. I remember when I first uh, fell in love with my wife, I was thunderstruck, dumbstruck. I, I had a look about me. I, I glowed. I floated wherever I went. Man, if you saw me, you would say, that man is in love. There was a look about it. I see people when they love certain things, there's a look 
about it. I mean, I know people that love food so much. They see that. My wife is one of those, man. Let me tell you. My wife loves me, but I think she loves food more. Uh, If I take her to a nice dinner, a bougie dinner, an expensive restaurant, she looks at that food. She eats that food, and there is just a look about it. How many know love looks a certain way? There's a look to I think about Will Ferrell and Elf. You know, he's eating that spaghetti with candy and maple syrup all over him. Mm, mm, There is a look to it. But here's the thing about love is that love actually rearranges the priorities of our lives. And I was thinking about it as I was preparing for this because as my life has gone through seasons and changes, I've fallen in love with certain things. And because of the love that I have, that love has has changed the priorities of my life. So when I fell in love with Chrissy, my priorities changed. My priorities, what I put first changed. I started putting her first. I started celebrating her more than myself. Then I had kids. And let me tell you, you have kids, your priorities change. There's not as much time for you and you're willing to make the sacrifice for those children. I fell in love with golf. And let me tell you, my priorities change. Chrissy will tell you about that. But you know that when you love something, it rearranges the priority of your life. And so I wanted to ask you a question today, a couple questions today. Because I think we say we love Jesus like this woman. We say we're passionate about Jesus, that we love him. We love him with all our heart, soul, strength, as the Bible commands us to. But I wanted to ask you today, when was the last time your love for God was so strong that it led you to do something beautiful? Because what I see here and what Jesus proclaims, he says this is a beautiful thing thing this woman has done for me you see her love for Jesus caused her to do something beautiful and I I look around the world right now and what I see is a lot of ugly what I see is a lot of hate what I see is a lot of division and you know what I think we need right now we need more beautiful things we need more beautiful things being released in the world but at the end of the day it's not just beauty for beauty's sake or art for art's sake what we need is more beautiful things that point people to the savior that we say we love because this world is ugly this world is hurting this world is dark this world is desperate and what i think this world needs is some beauty some beautiful things but The beautiful things that are just of this world are passing and fleeting and the beauty doesn't last. But when we do beautiful things with Jesus as the focus, let me tell you, those beautiful things actually change the atmosphere forever, wherever we have done them. The world needs more Christians that do beautiful things. And so what I wanted to challenge us with today is this idea that we would be a people that do beautiful things and if I could leave you with nothing else I would leave you with this statement if I was to encapsulate this entire message in one sentence it would be this being truly in love with Jesus leads to beautiful things for Jesus Let me say it again. Being truly in love with Jesus leads to beautiful things for Jesus. And so here's two questions I want to start this off with today. It's do you love Jesus as much as you should? And second, do you love him as much as you could? And I was challenged with these questions this week as the Lord dropped them into my heart. And I realized if I was to answer them honestly, I would say, no, I don't love Jesus as much as I should. And no, I don't love Jesus as much as I could. But today, I want to challenge our church. And I want to stand with you and I want to say, you know what? 
but I'm going to work today and tomorrow and every other day moving forward to love Jesus as much as I should or more to love him as much as I could. I'm never going to be perfect. I'm never going to fully arrive there. But I think that today God wanted to challenge us to be the people we say we are, to love Jesus with what we release into this world. And I believe that if we truly love Jesus, there will be beautiful things that come out of our lives. This world needs more beauty. And so I want to share with you just what beautiful things reveal. As I look at this text and as I was challenged by it, by this story of this woman, Mary, who did something that few thought was wise, that few respected, that few honored. And yet Jesus said, as long as they talk about me, this woman will be remembered. This story will be remembered. You see, beautiful things reveal first, they reveal devotion. And what Mary showed here was a devotion to Jesus. Now, devotion is something that I would say uh, we aren't real hep on in today's culture. What I mean is we're not loyal. And so when I think of devotion, you know what I think of? I think of Kings fans. Come on, somebody. You see, your boy is a Sacramento Kings fan. I've been a Sacramento Kings fan since I was like six years old. My dad took me to my first game. And I have loved them through thick and thin. We are currently on a 13-year playoff drought, well, 14 now. And so I've been praying. But let me tell you, people have actually told me, you know what, Caleb, I know you're a man of faith because you're still faithful to the Kings. They respect that faith. But let me tell you, devotion is hard. Devotion is hard because we go through valleys and we go through mountaintops and being devoted to a God who allows us to walk through hard things and hard situations is something that not all people are willing to stay committed to but what I believe is that we have a call to show the world what wholehearted devotion looks like you see in this day they didn't bathe much Unlike us in today's culture and Western civilization, uh, we bathe. Many of you are like two showers a day people. That's me. Uh, My wife thinks it's weird, uh, but I'm like morning, night. I can't go to bed until I have a second shower. Some days if I go work out in the middle of the day, it's three showers in a day. In this day, it was very different. They did not bathe regularly. They didn't have deodorant. They didn't have the same type of cleaning products that we have. And so when they went into a home, Usually a servant or the youngest person in the home would welcome them in. They'd been walking around in dirty, you know, dirty roads with dirty sandals. And so their feet would be disgusting from sweat and dirt and mud. Um, And so they would clean their feet before dinner. They would welcome them in, clean their feet. And then they would place a dab of ointment, of oil, of some sweet-smelling perfume or fragrance, they would dab it on the person's forehead. They would often dilute it with water, but there would still be a level of the ointment or the perfume within what it was that they had diluted it with. And they would place it on the person's forehead. Why? They would place it on them to mask their B.O. And, uh, And so this was something that was done commonly in this day. And And so they would walk into the home, they'd have their feet washed, they'd have the ointment placed on their head, and then they would go in and they'd begin to eat. They reclined at a table, which we actually have a picture they're going to throw up right now for you, uh, so you can see that. And this was what a dinner party would have looked like uh, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, or that area in the Middle East. They would recline around this table, and the ointment would mask the B.O., so it made the enjoyment of the dinner better. But Mary takes things to another level. You see, here they are. They come into this home. As we look at verse number three, they're at the home of Simon the leper. And we know that Simon was knowing that he was called the leper. They wouldn't have gone into a leper's home. And so Jesus had most likely healed him of his leprosy. Another incredible thing. It indicates he's no longer a leper. But the women... 
as you look at this picture, women would not have been allowed to eat at the table with the men. This was a very misogynistic, patriarchal society. So this would have been just the men reclining and eating, no women present. Or they would have been present, but they would have been serving. And they would have been eating separately. And so in this moment, this woman comes in. And she does something that was undignified. First of all, she drops her hair down, which this was something only prostitutes did. The women this day kept their hair covered. They had it up always. She uncovers her hair, drops her hair down, pours this expensive ointment on Jesus' feet on his head. It actually wipes his feet with her hair. What did this show? This showed devotion. I think that in today's culture, we've lost devotion to the things of God, to the person of Jesus. We've lost devotion to the house of God. And I want to ask you parents out there, I want you to think about, is the life you're living showing what your devotion is to to your children? Is Jesus what they would say you're devoted to as a family by what your priorities are? Because a lot of you say, well, well, I love Jesus. But when you love someone or something, it reprioritizes your life. And yet I look and I see a lot of families and, and the house of God and the things of God and the word of God and the worship of God is not very high on the priority list. And so my question to you is, do you really love him? Are your children seeing that you really love him? Is your family seeing that Jesus is a priority in your life? You see, one day your children are going to stand before Jesus. They're going to stand before a righteous God. And the Bible actually says that we'll give an account for what we did, how we lived. Let me tell you something. As your children stand before God, I know for a fact that he's not going to ask them what their three-point percentage was. He's not going to ask them what their musical prowess was. He's not going to ask them if they made it to the varsity team or the college team or the professional team. He's not going to say how many goals did you score, how many points did you average. He's going to ask them, have you been faithful? And they'll give an account for what they did in his name. You see, we've made the beautiful things about what I would say are earthly things. We think that if I accomplish, if I have musical prowess in this world, if I uh, am successful in this sport, in this activity, in this hobby, if I get the best grades, I'm not saying any of these things are bad, but I'm saying we've made those the beautiful things. When in reality, when we stand before God, the beautiful things that he's going to ask us about are the things we did in his name. The things that brought honor and glory and dignity and praise to his name. And so I want to ask you, what are you depositing in your children that has eternal significance? Some of you aren't parents. You're saying, well, that's not me. Thank God, because Caleb just came hot came hard, but I want to ask you the same question about you. Does your life show devotion to the things of God, to the house of God, to the person of God? Or if I looked at the priorities of your life, would he even be in your top ten? Would he be in your top five? You see, beautiful things reveal devotion in this woman did a beautiful thing. That's what Jesus called it. And this was like one moment, one act. How many of you know that one act, one moment of obedience is something that God, I believe, celebrates? And so do not undermine or discount the small things you do for God because it could be one thing that he's up in heaven celebrating. It could be one small act of obedience of maybe loving a person that you came across on the street, being kind to your neighbor, reaching out to that co-worker who who is hard to get along with. 
that one act I believe God is looking at and saying, that's a beautiful thing. But it takes devotion. Second, beautiful things reveal worship. I'm talking about showing the world wholehearted worship. A deep love worship. Not a I'm worried about what others think kind of worship. Now, how many know worship is more than just singing? But singing is part of worship. And so I actually want to challenge you in this place right now because I think that some of us are holding back in worship in the house of God, in how we worship physically, and it's actually disobedience. I was thinking about it because we look at the scriptures and the scriptures tell us to make a joyful noise. The scriptures tell us to lift our hands in the sanctuary. The scriptures tell us to clap our hands before the Lord, to shake the tambourine. The, the scriptures tell us to, to shout unto the Lord. And yet, I think a lot of people come into the house of God and we stand in silence. And we say, I, I'm not a singer. I talk to a lot of men and they're like, that's kind of like, I'm too manly to do that. I talk to people and it's like, I'm just not outward. I'm not expressive. I'm, a, I'm more a, of, a, of an internal processor in my worship. I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm not hating on the introverts. We love you. I love extroverts and introverts. But here's what I do want us to tell you. I want to challenge you that you would be obedient in your worship. And that means making a joyful noise. It doesn't mean it's the best sounding noise. But a joyful noise is what's coming out of your heart. So I know some of you can't sing. That's okay. You're like, I can't carry a tune. That's okay. Is there joy in it? Then make a noise. Some of you can't get your hands out of your pockets. I want to tell you the Bible tells us to lift our hands in the sanctuary. To clap our hands before the Lord. To praise him. To adore him. I want to challenge us as a church that we would get more expressive and physical in our worship. Why? Because it's obedience. And so to the men in the house, they're saying, it's kind of girly, it's not my thing. No, it is biblical. There's nothing feminine about it or masculine about it. There's just something biblical about it. So may we clap our hands. May we lift our hands. May we shout with joy. May we sing in tune or off tune, out of tune. We need some auto tune, you know what I'm saying, some of us. But man, there's something about wholehearted worship, and that's what this woman did. Mary here, she brings the flask, which we know would have actually been, as historians have said, it would have been probably a family heirloom. Most likely it would have been something that was passed down the family, something that you would never use all at once. I mean, that would be absurd as the disciples and, and people in the room reacted to it because it was precious. It was rare. But how many know that when you are enthralled, when your heart is enthralled in worship to God, you will do some things in worship that others would say is ridiculous, that others would say is undignified. Her heart bursts forth in worship by sacrificing in a huge way. Now historians have actually said that based on their reaction and how they said what this could have been sold for, that this family heirloom, this flask, could have been valued at as much as $3,800 an ounce. That's a valuable bottle of perfume. And what does she do? She breaks it. And she empties the entire flask on the head and the feet of Jesus. I mean, thinking about it even now after putting in that context, it's excessive. It's extravagant. It's absurd. But I wonder what the church would look like if we had this kind of spirit and attitude and heart as it came to the devotion and the worship we have for Jesus. How many more excessive, ridiculous, absurd, extravagant, 
beautiful things would be done in this world by God's children. You see, this world needs beautiful things. But we hold back in our worship. We hold back in our sacrifice. And I was thinking about it, and, and, and I, I believe that this woman did this because she had a heart that so loved Jesus that she couldn't help herself. How many know that sometimes when you have a heart that has been connected to and, and, and wrapped up in the love of God, you can't help yourself but do some things that make no sense to others. You see, what did God do? God poured out his righteous wrath for our sins onto this man, Jesus punishing him for all of us. It was an act, a pour of extravagant, excessive love for you and for me. And when I think about that, I think, how could I not worship? When Jesus broke the flask of sin upon his own son, it should have been broken on me, but it was broken onto his son and it was excessive and it was, it was extravagant. It was the love of Jesus. The love of God. How could I not worship that kind of Savior? But many of us know that we don't sing even though the scriptures tell us to sing. We don't clap even though the Scriptures tell us to clap. We don't rejoice even though the scriptures tell us to rejoice. We don't worship even though the scriptures tell us to worship. And I wonder if we really love Jesus. Do I love him as much as I should? Do I love him as much as I could? If I'm afraid in a room full of fellow believers to even express myself physically to him. Third, beautiful things reveal conviction. Ooh, this is a word we don't like in the church anymore. I mean, talk to me about grace, Caleb, but don't talk to me about conviction. Talk to me about mercy, Caleb, but don't talk to me about conviction. You see, conviction shows the world that there's a different way to live. You hear me, church? Conviction shows the world that there's a different way to live. We need a church that chooses conviction over criticism and cynicism. You see, we look at John chapter 12, and this is the account in the Gospel of John, this same account, where Jesus is at dinner and Mary breaks this perfume, this ointment, and puts it on his head and his feet and uses her hair to wipe it. But in this account, it actually gives us the perspective of Martha too. You see, Martha is a sister of Mary. And Martha's in the house and she's a busybody and she's preparing the food and she's serving the men because in this day, that's what the women did. The men around the table and she's working and and toiling, and slaving, and, and serving, and blessing, and she's bringing out food, and she's taking out plates, and she's doing all these things for Jesus and the disciples, and this is her act of worship, of love, and I believe it was a beautiful thing, but when she sees what her sister does, she criticizes her. When she sees what Mary does, She's cynical about her act. And she actually questions Jesus about her sister. Why was she not serving like me? I mean, I did all this for you. I served you. And she just sat there and just poured out perfume on you and wasted all this money and wasted this family heirloom potentially and undignified herself. Martha served. But Mary's act of service looked different. Martha criticizes Mary, but you know what Jesus says? He says, you know what, Martha? Mary actually chose the better thing. And I was thinking about that because so often we elevate one thing over the other. 
But I don't think that's what Jesus is trying to point out here. I don't think he's trying to say, well, yeah, look, Mary's better than you. What she did was better than what you did. I think what Jesus is trying to point out is that we cannot value one gift, one act, one, one releasing of serving more than another. Because we all have something to bring and something to give. Martha served. Mary's act of service looked different. And Jesus, because of Martha's criticism, had to bring correction. And he said she actually chose the better thing. I want to challenge us, church, that we would be a, a house of conviction, not criticism. Because when I look at the church so often, I see more cynicism and criticism than conviction. And we've become a, a church of consumers, the church. I'm not saying our church, but the church. And I'm guilty of this myself, so I'm not just preaching this at you. This act, this moment, I think it saddened Jesus because he was thankful for Martha serving him. But he was also thankful for Mary serving him in a different way. And I, I wonder if the church stopped and realized and recognized and did some internal work and reflection and said, you know what, most of us, are critical of the church. We're critical that they don't spend the money this way or they don't give it that way. We're critical because the, the music's too loud or the drums are beating too hard or, you know, they, they, the coffee is too bland or this or that. The lights are too bright. They're not bright enough. And we criticize and we're cynical. And I think that what Jesus was doing here to Martha was he was just telling her, look, what you did was good. But what she did was good too. And I have to bring correction to you and actually say she chose the, the better thing, the more beautiful thing. And what, what I think he's wanting to say to us today and to you, church, is that we would just choose beautiful things. That the love of God in our heart would lead us to do beautiful things for our Savior and for the people around us. And that we would stop being critical and cynical of the other believers and of the church and of what we think our brother or our sister should be doing. But we would just fixate on ourselves and our relationship with God and say, I don't know about them. I'm not worried about that. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I'm going to love. I'm going to do beautiful things. Why? Because this world needs beautiful things. It needs a people of conviction, not more critical spirits. And I think about Mary and the conviction in her heart was so strong to bless Jesus in this way, to anoint Jesus in this way. I really believe she didn't even know what she was doing. Because while Jesus had talked about his death, none of them actually thought he was going to die. In fact, they would rebuke him for it. Peter tried to rebuke Jesus when he said, yeah, I'm going to die. He says, no, that's not far be it from you, Lord. That's not going to happen. He had to say, get behind me, Satan. I don't know that Mary even knew what she was doing. But I do know this. I know that she was led by a conviction in her heart to do something excessive, something radical, something extravagant, to release a beautiful blessing of service onto her Savior because she was preparing him. It says here in this text, as we read earlier, verse 14, Jesus is speaking. He says she has done, verse 9, or verse 8, what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her, which leads to the final part. 
of what beautiful things reveal. You see beautiful things reveal an example. We need to show the world that we're here for the world. What are you saying, Caleb? I'm saying this dark, desperate, hurting world that we've been called to. We have not been called to wall ourselves off and to hide from the world to just say, we're just going to hold on. The, the Us three and no more. The church, we're just going to hold on until Jesus returns. No, we've been called to go out into the world with the hope and the love and the beauty of the presence of the Savior and to change the atmosphere. We're to be an example. I think that a lot of people hold back. They hold back from giving. They hold back from serving. They hold back from loving. And I wanted to ask you this question. Do you have more time? Does it feel like you have more time because you hold back from serving God? Do you feel like you have more money because you hold back from being generous to God? Do you feel like you have more blessings because you hold back from being a blessing to others as God has called you to? I think a lot of people are holding back. You hold back or do you, do you feel like you have more relationships because you've held back from building relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ? Here's what I want to say to you. This woman, Mary, gave what she could. She did what she could. She laid down what she could. She served how she could. She loved how she could. And I want to ask you that you would have the same heart that says, God, I'm, I'm done holding back. I think that there's a church and there's people in this church. There's people listening right now. You've held back out of fear. And I believe God wanted to speak directly to someone's heart right now as you're watching this online. He wanted to tell you, do not let fear hold you back from releasing beautiful things into this world. And it's not always this grand, extravagant thing. Sometimes it's small. It's a small sacrifice. It's a small gift. It's a small act of love. It's a small moment of blessing. But the small things create beautiful things. And so my question to you is, will you be the example of Jesus to this world? Will you release the beautiful things in this world or will you continue to hold back you see that anointing that Jesus received at that dinner. That perfume that was poured on his head and his feet. That aroma, that ointment would have been with him all the way to the cross on his final days. I picture Jesus and, and, and he said it, you've prepared me for my burial. And I picture Jesus going to be whipped and beaten. And he can still smell the ointment, the perfume. I picture him being nailed to the cross and he can still smell that, that perfume that was poured out him, this extravagant, excessive, ridiculous act of this woman. But it carried him, was with him, even on the cross. This beautiful thing set an example that still we are talking about 2,000 years later. You see, when you love Jesus, you'll do things that don't make sense. But they're things that God will use. You see, God uses obedience. He uses devotion. He uses an example of love. But he can't use what we hold back. So I want to challenge this church that we would stop holding back. Some of you have been holding back from giving. You've been holding back from serving you've been holding back from loving you've been holding back from getting in community building relationships i want to say stop holding back i want to close with this last thing this last week we had the graduation of life for maverick flurry if you hadn't heard our youth pastor sam and carly their baby had been born uh, with a lot of complications 
he lived seven weeks and then he breathed his final breath and received his eternal healing. We were praying as a church for healing all those weeks, every day. I was praying for him every day. Thank you for praying. Thank you for lifting Sam and Carly up. It, it wasn't the result that we had been praying for. It wasn't the result we had hoped for. And yet I believe that God still worked and is working. And I'm telling you this because they held the graduation of life, which is what they called it. I love that. It wasn't a funeral. It wasn't even a celebration of life, but he graduated graduated to heaven, graduated to a new body, a whole body. And they held the graduation of life and the whole uh, day went by and the, the service and it was beautiful and, and heart-wrenching and tears were cried and, and people laughed and there was joy in the room, there was hope in the room, there was comfort in the room, there was love in the room. But we got to the end of this graduation of life and Sam actually went up and he took the mic and our youth pastor gave an opportunity for anyone there that did not know Jesus to receive Jesus as their savior, as their Lord. And he gave a salvation message. And I got to be honest, I was sitting there and I was in shock because I know for me, I couldn't have done that. I don't believe I know there's many in there like, man, I can't believe he's up there talking. Not only that, but he's, the whole point and what he's even sharing is about Jesus. And in that moment, and coming to today, I, I just, it stuck with me. Because what I believe it was, was it was a beautiful thing. It was Sam breaking a jar of ointment of perfume and pouring it out on his savior and letting the world know look at the end of the day we have hope and you can have that hope too and I just wanted to share that with you because I believe that while this was an example for us that that Sam gave I believe that it is a challenge for us too that every day we have opportunities to release beautiful things in this world. And as I said at the beginning, being truly in love with Jesus leads to beautiful things for Jesus. And I want to be a person that is truly in love with Jesus so much that beautiful things for Jesus come out of my life. So do you love Jesus as much as you should? And do you love him as much as you could? If you bow your heads wherever you are watching this from. And I want to give an opportunity like Sam did at that graduation of life. I want to give an opportunity for you to surrender your heart, your life to Jesus. A Jesus that endured the cross and the pain and the suffering and all the sin of you and me and all of mankind was poured out on to him the successive extravagant act of love by our God was poured out on our Savior this beautiful thing so that you and I could step into life the most beautiful thing and receive the eternal inher inheritance of life with God forever I want to give you that opportunity wherever you are if you need to maybe you need to recommit your life to Jesus right now you say, I haven't been loving as much as I should. I haven't been loving as much as I could. We need to give your life to Jesus for the first time. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, I love you. I need you. I ask you today to forgive me of my sin. Thank you for laying it all down, for paying the price that I should have paid so that I could have life and life to the fullest. Today, I receive eternal life, my eternal inheritance, not because of anything I've done, but because of what you did. I love you, Jesus, and I pray all this in your name. Amen. Hey, 
If you prayed that prayer, I just want to tell you the angels in heaven are rejoicing. We're rejoicing with you. And I want to tell you uh, this is an amazing journey that you are beginning. And we want to help you in that faith journey. So make sure that you connect with us. Come this next Sunday. We have a box for you with a Bible and a book. If you don't live here, um, you can mark in the chat right now below that you raise your hand to receive Jesus and one of our team will reach out to you and connect with you. But church, may we do beautiful things in this world. May we release beautiful things in this world. We're praying for you. We love you. Make sure you come back this next Sunday, October 31st for our celebration follow day fun. We're going to have an amazing Sunday of the word, worship, and then a lot of fun for the family afterwards. So church, we love you. We're praying for you. We missed you today, but we can't wait to see you in person next week. God bless you guys. Let's this week do beautiful things for Jesus. Love you church.